Let me hear you say S A C. Yeah, we chop a game, man. Artist, uh, the artist, say S A C. Yeah, if you creative, come hey, sit down. Let me with hear me. you say S A C. Yeah, we chop a game, man. Artist, the artist, say S A C. Yeah, uh, if you creative, come sit down with me, man. Huh? You know, you know, hey boy, you know, starving artist creations, man. Artist to artist. Uh, oh, <laughs> what is? You know, you know, your boy Dre, man. I'm back with another starving artist creation. I'm on a set of my show, Artist to Artist, right now, where we sit down with a variety of talent and really chop game about the grind, the hustle of being a creative. I've been hitting y'all in the head with these episodes, man, this week. Ain't no different. I got a very special guest. Every other week, I've been having male guests on here. This guest set precedent. And when I say precedent, I'm not talking about the orange asshole in the White House. I'm talking about precedent. First lady on Artist to Artist. You dig? This cat is a real dope writer, a photographer, a painter, self-taught artist, the origin of original herself. Jacqueline Hamilton was good. Thank you for having me. Hi. For sure, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. So, you know, you're familiar with the show, man. You know, artist to artist, we like to really chop game about the grind, you know, the foundation, the craft, the business. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, before we really dig into the, the craft and the business aspect, you know, let's talk about a little bit of the backstory. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you tell us where you're from and a little bit about your upbringing? Okay, well, I'm from Seattle, born and raised, um, and I grew up out here, grew up in the South End, been out there pretty much my whole life, Uh, still (laughs) out there, Um, and I went to Franklin High School, went to, you know, Aki Kurosi, Mm -hmm. did everything out here. I didn't really leave Seattle until... um, I went to college, and even then, I didn't go far. I went to WSU. Mm. Um, I came back 2010, and I've just been like working, taking care of myself, taking care of my daughter since then. And really, just within like the last couple years, two three years, is when I really started to dig in to really working creatively. But I've always been a creative person. Mm. So like as a kid, I wrote. I've been writing since I could learn how to read, since I learned how to spell. Um, and photography, like I always took photos, I always love to take photos, I always love to look at photos. So those two things have really just gotten to be really serious things that I've been digging into lately, but within like the last two years, but they've always been stuff that I felt passionate about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you, you mentioned that you're a mother, you know what I'm saying? So let's talk about that for a minute. Cause you're doing a multitude of things, whether it be, you know, on the creative side or on the on the livelihood side, you know what I'm saying? So how do you manage being a, a artist, a mom, a, you know, a worker, and still have your sanity at the end of the day? How do you do that? Um, sometimes I don't have my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> there are definitely mornings yeah, yeah. where I am, like, literally crying, throwing stuff. Like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed today. I have so much to do and I don't know how I'm going to get it all done. But you, I just have those moments and I, I move past them. Mm-hmm. Um, but the main thing is just, you know, keeping in perspective what why it is that I want to do those things. And for me, the main thing is I want to be able to, well, I'll let me go back a little bit. So my, I come from a family of like entrepreneurs mm-hmm. and just really strong women in general. Like my grandmother went to college and she was college educated, but my grandfather wasn't. My grandfather didn't actually complete his high school diploma until he was like 43 years old. Mm -hmm. So, but by the time he went back to finish his high school diploma, he was a, you know, he had his own business. He was making like $10,000 a month, like just self-made man. He literally went back to, that's cheap right there. (laughs) He literally went back to school just to kind of like, Prove that to himself. Like mm-hmm. I'm gonna get this diploma because I like he dropped out of school when he was um, 11 years old to help his aunt take care of her her 11 kids. Damn. So um, 
for me, it's about being able to be more than just a worker bee, being the nine to five, like utilizing my talents and my intelligence to be able to create like a financial freedom for myself. Mm. So that's what really pushes me. And I want to be able to give my daughter like, you know, all the attention that she deserves, especially going into like puberty in high school. I feel like that's when kids get into the most trouble. Mm -hmm. So like it's my goal for the last three years. It's been my goal to be like at least home, at least have a schedule where I can drop my daughter off and pick her up from school every day by the time she's in middle school. So that's really what I keep in perspective on those days where it's just like, oh my gosh, this is too much. So, you know, you, you mentioned, it was interesting, you know, you mentioned some, uh, you know, some powerful figures in your life, whether it be your grandma, you know, at, at what point did you, because, you know, even though we're, you might have been a child and you, you can look back on it now as an adult and say, you know, I had very powerful women in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, at what point did you realize, you know, the significance of that being a black woman yourself and, and having those role models and figures in your life? When I became a mother... And every year since then. So my daughter is eight now. And as she's going through different changes and stages and transitions, it's helped me realize, like, how I was supported through those same stages and transitions. Like, my grandmother, you know, I always, I speak so highly of her. I love her to death. Mm. She's a matriarch in every sense of the word. Shout out to grandma. Shout out to grandma. Shout out to my grandma. You know, (laughs) know, shout her out. Did she got an Instagram or any of that? Hey, shout her out. No, she don't do no type of internet. (laughs) She's old school, but she does use emojis when she texts. Okay, okay. Hey, hey, you know, she's still with it. (laughs) But she, um, she worked, you know, she was very traditional, cooked, clean, Mm -hmm. part of the community, um, part of the church community. She did Jack and Jill. Mm -hmm. Um, she was just all around she did everything she could to support her family and then you know on top of that it it came into me and my grandfather always had a closer relationship growing up Mm. but it came into perspective like my grandma was the one that had a formal education and she had to have a big part in building that business for my grandfather okay so like she never talked about that she never was like oh i gave him you know i helped him do this or i put this together for him she just did it very humbly and you know very classy i always say she's like one of the last ladies i really know like which very... is low key a parallel to black women and men in society yes. in general yes so exactly yeah, for sure but you know you, you mentioned you know that you were interested in, in in creativity at a very early age you know what whether it be artists or uh, you know political figures you know angela davis and things who were some of the people that inspired you you know to to really tap into your passion for creativity um early on the i would say the first writer that really inspired me was my angelo mm. i i read phenomenal Bars. women when i was about 8 and that stuck with me like i went you know i was one of, i was one of the kids that like had a computer and internet access mad young mm-hmm. so i went and looked up you know i went and typed in the poem online and i mean on my lap on our computer not a laptop we didn't have those back then <laughs> <laughs> on oh, our DSL desktop joints. <laughs> and i t- typed it down out of the book that i was reading and i printed it off and i recited it a bunch of times over and over and she was really the first person that really inspired me to Mm -hmm. like write poetry and just be creative and it's you know it's crazy because it comes full circle because i just read i know why the cage bird sings Mm -hmm. with you know last year and it's just and the thing that amazes me about maya angelo is that she also as at a very young age she had that passion for words Mm -hmm. For, and that's a big deal to me. Like semantics is everything to me. Mm. Like, like words mean a lot. You know, they each of them have a definition for a reason. And I think just being young and my grandma, back to her, she was big, really big on using the English language properly. And so between learning how to read and write with her and getting that exposure to my Angelo, it just opened up like the world to me as far as reading and writing. Mm. So, um, and I just always, I was always a bookworm. I still am, but Mm -hmm. you know, I always had a book, always was reading. Um, and it's actually really cool to see that my daughter is kind of taking the same route. For sure. So clearly, so you're talking about Maya Angelou and, you know, so I'm going to guess that writing 
out of you know all of the things that you do now because you're a very creative person whether it be painting and photography mm -hmm. and so i'm gonna guess writing was your first love yes okay writing, so, so what about the other two when did you develop the love for those um i would say that photography came later like toward um toward middle school the end of middle school mm. i got like my first like i would get like those disposable cameras and take them to school and take pictures old school yes old school and i mean even at franklin i would bring some to school and then finally towards my the end of my senior year at franklin i ended up getting a digital camera and that just kind of changed it all for me like I took that everywhere i went like even in college like i would be at parties like Taking pictures, <laughs> you're supposed to be there turning up, She'd and be at I would parties be there incriminating taking, folks. Yes, You'd be exactly. like, "Hey, no, 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 not me, <laughs> not me." I would me. get the messages the next, you know, yeah. week on Facebook, like, "Hey, untag me <laughs> from that photo, take that down." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, for sure, that's where it started for me, and I just always love taking pictures. I love, I especially love capturing people in authentic moments. Mm. Like, I think it's dope, you know, that people do portrait photography and you know do senior photos stuff like that but i think it's really cool to catch people in the moment and catch that joy or mm -hmm. that sadness or whatever it is that they're going through at that time to be able to document that for them mm -hmm. you know and i think today like that idea is watered down mm -hmm. it's almost like oh i want to put my phone away so i can actually enjoy this moment i want to put my camera away so i can actually enjoy this moment but It's like you want to be able to document those moments. Oh, yeah. Like I lost my grandfather to Alzheimer's. And if anybody, you know, is not familiar with that, it's a disease that is, it's you know, it's degenerative to your brain. Yeah, exactly. So you lose your memories. And a lot of times with Alzheimer's patients, the only thing that can, you know, that helps them keep kind of, you know, on track is to look at photos. Mm -hmm. So like that all kind of ties into why all of that means so much to me. Um So later, the the painting came along way later. It was something I always wanted to do. I took a painting class in 2010, and I was really surprised at what I was able to do in that mm -hmm. class, like just with the direction of, you know, our instructor. Um, and it's like, if anybody ever wants to take a painting class and like totally get into that, they do everything in a painting class. You mm -hmm. get your nude models, your still life, <laughs> like you get all of that in your in oh, the intro shit. painting class. Um, and that was just really eye opening for me of just like the different styles and stuff that, you know, of, of visual art. Mm -hmm. um, but I never thought I could draw. And I always felt like that was an important thing yeah. to painting. But, you know, I've learned that you can teach yourself anything. And so for the last year or so, I've been really working on learning how to draw, working on being a better painter, learning technique and stuff like that. And it's been coming along. Like I just did my first um, art show back in uh, February. Mm -hmm. It was an art show, so that's like fashion show. So I walked in the fashion show and I was asked to bring some pieces of art with me. And I actually sold all three of the pieces I brought with me, mm -hmm. which I was totally surprised by because I just was like, these are just my babies that I painted <laughs> and I don't think they're good enough to go home with anybody but, I mean, but somebody but, but, bought them. So, so I don't mean to cut you <laughs> off, but you know, you're talking about, you're saying, you know, you, you never knew you could draw and stuff, but I mean, I think that's one of the beautiful things about art is that it's subjective. There's so many different kinds of arts and, or, or you know, uh, paintings and pictures. Some people are super realist. Some, and you have like Basquiat, who's like, this looks like a, yeah, a child abstract. drew this, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And so it's like, I, I think that's the beautiful thing about art is that there's it, no rules, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You For know, so, sure. but but let's talk about, because we're talking about the foundation, man. We're talking about motherhood and, and, and you know, uh, being a woman and stuff. So I want to talk to you about how you, because aside from the arts and stuff, you know, You are in the corporate world. Yes. <laughs> you're you're very you're very intelligent and you have a strong mind. So how is that navigating in this in this corporate world which operates by maybe a set of rules that aren't ours? Yes. <laughs> so to speak, you know what I mean? So so how how is that for you, you know what I'm saying? Um it's taken a while to really find my stride in the corporate world mm. just because, you know, coming out of Seattle, especially South Seattle, where 
the demographic is, you know, people of color outnumber, you know, non people of color mm. like twenty to one. Mm. And so being around like a handful of white kids at Franklin and then going to WSU and being around 20,000 white people <laughs> was like a culture shock for me. Like it was an adjustment mm-hmm. and it has been an adjustment since I started working in corporate because that's how that world works. Mm-hmm. It works how it don't work how it works in the hood. It oh, works no, how it works, sure. you know, over in Bellevue. Of, uh, passive aggression. Passive aggression. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. So, I mean, my first real corporate role I had was at, um, the Federal Home Loan Bank, mm. and I actually worked under a black woman there, and she gave me a lot of game. Mm. She gave me a lot of gems, you know, just... And I'm I'm the first to admit that I could be hard-headed, so a lot of the stuff that she told me back in 2012, I'm just now applying. But it took me all this time to, one, build up, like, my credential and my skill set, because, and then, two, to just realize, okay, you can't do it your own way. Mm-hmm. And I've been trying to do it my own way thus far. Like, I'm going to be me and I'm not going <laughs> to, like, adjust that for any company or any person. For sure. So now it's it's less about, like, pretending because I, I can't do that. I can't go in there and, and be phony. But it's just more so about going in there and getting the work done and making sure that as a person of color, as a black woman working in a corporate world that, like, I make my presence and my value undeniable Mm -hmm. yeah for sure you know and i think that's a you know like i said as a as a mother you set a great example for your daughter who sees you not only you know going into that type of environment and thriving but also coming home and working on your dream you know so through through your totality of whether it be work and then coming home and working on your your business and your brand you know what example are you trying to convey to your daughter um, my daughter told me very early in life that she wanted to be a veterinarian and she wanted to be a fashion designer and she wanted to own mm-hmm. her own store dope and so i told her you could do both if you really want to mm-hmm. like if you want to own your own fashion store and be a vet. You hold can on, hold on. Totally I got, a, I got an idea right now. <laughs> she can, she can be both. She can make fashionable clothes for pets. Right. Hard. Right. <laughs> Hard. Exactly. I need a cut. If I, <laughs> hey, if that happens, if that goes to the version, I need something off of that. Would, you know, yeah, you heard it here, sure. artist, artist, man. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking into existence, man. See, you about to see doggy outfits, man. They coming so fly. Yes, hey, doggy hoodies you did. and sneakers. <laughs> yes. Um, For sure. So I told her that she could do whatever she wants. And I, and that's been my big thing is I want her to know that she can do whatever she wants to do. And then on top of that, the fact that I had my daughter when I was 19, I don't ever want her to feel like she stopped me from accomplishing anything mm. in life. So I really bust my ass to be able to say, okay, look, I still got here even though, even through these things that I, these obstacles that I had to overcome. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're, I, I'd imagine your daughter's very supportive and she's always in your corner. You know, how does your, how does the rest of your family and your friends feel about your business and your brand that you're trying to build up? How has your support been? Um, You know, it's, it's a little, it's hard because everybody doesn't see it, especially coming from like a traditional black family mm-hmm. where people, everybody just, it's like, you better go to work. <laughs> you, <laughs> like, you better go to work and you better get that paycheck <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and do For what sure. you need to do. Oh yeah. So, you know, coming from that, like on my mom and my dad's side, it's very, very traditional. Like, you know, everybody, it's not a whole lot of like, both of my grandfathers on my mom and my dad's side are entrepreneurs, but they're, you know, they're still like, take care of yourself. Make sure mm-hmm. you're good. Like you can't ride the wave of my success. You got to do your own thing. Mm-hmm. So I think the creative part doesn't seem as serious to them. It seems more like a hobby, but at the same time, like I don't, I, it's not significant for me to get their support you know what i mean Mm. like as long as they are like my family and they love me and they give me like the the motivation that i need like saying okay you know you got it or i'm proud of you like when i do make strides and things that's all that matters to me for sure 
So, you know, we, we did a little background, man. That was very insightful, you know what I'm saying? I feel like I got some knowledge now, <laughs> you know, to, to go into this next. You know, we're talking about creation. We're talking about the craft, you know what I'm saying? So we're going to cover a multitude of creativity in this next section in this next section you know because like i said you're a dope writer you know you're a dope photographer i've seen some of your pieces you, you know what i'm you. saying i i see a, a you know this one out of 365 i'm imagining that's a, every one for the year Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know uh, that's uh, one aspect, but then painting as well. You know, you've seen some of my stuff, man. I'm a painter as well, so you yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. can relate. You mm-hmm. know, uh, first, I'm a, before I even get into it, what kind of paint do you use? I used. I started off using oils. I okay. literally just started using acrylics. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm the opposite. The month, a mm. month ago. Which one you like better? Um, I like oil paintings better because they don't dry out as fast when you're painting yeah but acrylics are cool because it's easier to get like a more cleaner um photo of like like you know a visual of what Mm -hmm. you're painting like you get cleaner lines Mm -hmm. and it's easier to layer colors and stuff like that like painting you know oil painting you gotta take like it it can take i knew people you know when i was in class that like we're still working on a painting for a year (laughs) because it takes so long to dry and you gotta you know do those layers and stuff so um i like oils better though just because i feel like it's it's less it's more abstract Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I just had to get that out. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't the order that I was trying to go in, but I just needed to say, okay, acrylics or oils, you know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, let's talk about writing a little bit. You know, who, when you're when you're making your pieces, you know, some people like write in the hopes that, you know, a certain demographic will gravitate toward it or whatever. But, you know, when you write, who do you write your pieces for? Um. Well, I definitely write my pieces for like the black perspective okay um and it's and i try to do it in a way that's still tasteful Mm -hmm. you know that speaks to the fact that we are very um complex you know like you know like how we were just talking about like i'm i grew up in the hood i got hood stories like anybody else but i work in corporate too for sure and i'm not the only person that you know lives on both sides of those fences so, like, I write for those people, the people that are just kind of trying to navigate themselves through life that are probably teaching themselves, like, teaching themselves how to do things and how to act in certain settings and stuff like that. So, I would say I write for that, and then I write to educate in, in, most, in most cases. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, some people, because I, I had Jeff Cheatham on, you know, he, he writes books and he's a child. He writes children's books and stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are different kinds of writers. How would you describe your writing style? Um, I would say, ooh, that's a that's a tough question. That's hard. That's a hard question because I literally have written so much. Like, I won a Young Playwrights Award in high school for... Um, a play. Oh, you know, pop your collar. <laughs> you know, hey, hey, you know. That I wrote. Hey. So I can do creative writing. Okay. I can do editorial pieces. I, you know, I, I write poetry. But I guess I would say that my writing style is is very honest and very clean. And I would I would not call it playful. Like I, you know, I'm not. For some reason, I can be a very playful person in life, but on paper, it's it's not serious, but it's not a game either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I, I want to be, I want as just how I'm articulating myself here to you, mm-hmm. I want that to come across the same way in my writing. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, because I, I've read some of your pieces and they're, and they're very insightful. First of all, you know, they're all grammatically correct. You know what I'm saying? And then and then they grab your attention and, it, you know, it makes you think of things from a different angle. And you say, oh, huh, you know, I, I never really thought of it that way. You know, so I was reading one of your pieces. Um, you know, you, you were talking about um, keeping your day job. You know what I'm saying? And so we kind of touched on that with the corporate mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. aspect of it. But, you know, talk to me about that piece. You know, why why is it important to, you know, because you're saying, you know, don't just look at what other people are doing, but also look at the backstory and how long it may have taken that person to develop and to get to that level. You know what I'm saying? So, so how does that relate, you know, when you say, okay, keep your day job but also work on your dream you know what I'm saying? Yeah. how does that apply to you um yeah for sure like 
today, you know, one thing, okay, I'll say this. One thing I always see online is like these articles that are like, oh, I quit my job in my 20s yeah. to pursue <laughs> my dream. <laughs> or, you know, I did this and, you know, just whatever, where it's just yeah. like I took a leap of faith. And I definitely am all on that, you know, take a leap of faith, take a risk, do what you got to do to make your dreams happen. Mm -hmm. But when you have a family, when you have um, bills, <laughs> when you have things that you have to take care of, you can't really do stuff like that, you know, not without a proper safety net. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for me, I just want people to understand that, like, it don't come easy. Like, everybody sees these people, they think they blow up overnight, mm. and it, it's not that. Like, Grind. even somebody like Trinidad James, who, you know, we could call him a one-hit wonder, had to work a long time before he got to be that mm. one-hit wonder. Like, <laughs> he real. had to go and For practice real. and rap and be whatever character he had to, like, he had to develop that persona, whether mm. that's really him or whether that's who he is on camera. All of that has to develop first. Like for me, I feel like I'm on year three of like a seven, eight year journey. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I feel like everything, everybody's so rushed to get stuff out and put it out there for the world to see it and critique it and to say, oh, I'm working, I'm doing something. And it's like, I think the most valuable work that you're going to do is going to be behind the scenes. You got to enjoy the process. Yeah, you got to enjoy the process. And there's going to be days where, you know, it's frustrating and you're just going to be like, I don't want to do this no more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this. For but, sure. But then at the same time, at least for me, being like a regular, not a regular person, but like mediocre person isn't enough for me either. Nah, like, nah, I don't want to look back 20 years from now and be like, all I did was work a job. So, you know what? You have a, you have a variety of you know, pieces, you know, in regards to your writing, you know, how do you come up with new topics and things to write about? Because you cover everything from, you know, ideas or mind states about, you know, jobs and things to artists' pieces and things like that. Or, you know, how do you come up with new topics to write about? The main thing is when I'm trying to pick something that I want to write about is, well, one, because I feel like I'm in this this growth phase for, for my professional writing career, mm -hmm. I try to do things that are different and that are out of my like normal, what I do usually when it comes to writing. So the variety of pieces that you'll see on Origin of Original are a reflection of that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You spit it over it. Shout it out one time. <laughs> Shout it out one time. Origin of Original .com. <laughs> Um, yeah, a variety of those, you'll see a variety of pieces and it just goes to the different, it, it's, it's like a living portfolio for the different type of work, um, that I feel like I'm capable of doing and that, and that I share. And, but I, you know, I put a lot of effort into those pieces. Like I write, um, music pieces sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's just about stuff that I feel like just, you mentioned earlier, and I appreciate that is that I try to give alternative angles to things that we've already seen before. Mm. And that's a that's a big thing for me because, you know, there is 150, I should probably say thousand <laughs> stories about any one thing that happens. Mm. And, you know, everybody writes about the same stuff. Everybody's passing around information about the same stuff. And I just want to be able to put out different versions of what people are li looking at, what they're listening to, what they're finding out about. Um, yeah, like, you know, one of my favorite pieces that I have on the site is, uh, how the police stole Christmas, mm. which is a piece about, um, when a couple, you know, a few years back when Michael Brown was murdered there and then subsequently, uh, Tamir Rice right after in that November, a lot of people were complaining about how, you know, the these people were protesting and ruining Christmas and taking away from the spirit of that time of the year. And mm. it's like, these people are responding, you know, they're responding to an injustice that happened to them, that happened to their family, that is happening repeatedly to their people. And so if you're going to blame anybody, blame the perpetuators of this violence, sure. not the people that are responding to it. For sure. So... That's the type of stuff, you know, I like to put out there is just kind of give people an alternative angle to look at things. 
You know, in one of your pieces, you know, we're talking about your pieces. She got so many dope pieces, man. Hey, if you're not hip, origin of original, man, you better go check it out, man. She got all kinds of stuff on there. You know, think pieces make you think deep about yourself and reconsider what you already thought. You dig what I'm saying? You know, but one of your pieces, you were talking about, you know, selling some of your paintings and, you know, your emotions that went with that. So, you know, what what kind of emotional attachment do you have to your work, whether it be writing or your painting or whatever what kind of emotional attachment do you have to your pieces well i think any artist has emotional attachment should have an emotional attachment to the work because it's it's expression Mm. at the basis that's what it is it's just expression of whatever you're feeling whatever you're going through in the time period um in that particular piece you know I i was talking about the art show that i just did recently and I was in, I was asked to bring pieces with me and even with selecting the pieces I was going to bring, like I bought pieces that I would be okay letting go mm. in the event that they weren't going to come home, mm-hmm. but I wasn't anticipating them <laughs> not coming home. So when I got a phone call and they were like, you know, the, the curator for the event was like, Hey, somebody wants to buy your pieces. All of them. Let's all of exact. them. All, all three. Of them. And Boss moves. <laughs> so, you know, I like we negotiated price and it didn't really hit me until maybe an hour after I got off the phone with them. Like, wow, I'll never see that stuff again. And then on top of that, when I was like sharing the news that I sold that people were like, oh, do you have pictures of them? And I didn't really even have either. I had pictures of the paintings that were like in process, like mm-hmm. they weren't done yet. Like the complete version that the, the you know, the customer took home. Or I just didn't have pictures of them at all. And that made me so sad in that moment because I was like, <laughs> wow, like it's just gone. Like <laughs> there's no proof that I even did yeah, this. Yeah. And you know, it it was like really I learned something about creating in that in that moment just because it's it is such an emotional thing. It is such a personal thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell people all the time and like I'm not an expert at nothing like i'm learning to do things just like everybody else but i tell people all the time like create because you want to create Mm -hmm. don't create to make money off of your creation because you're tainting your own experience by creating you're going to be disappointed by something you make if you put it out and it don't sell versus you just making something because Mm -hmm. it felt good to make that yeah, so you know, just a little, uh, a little bit. I, I soaked up some game one time from my, you know, my father-in-law Vaughn Edwards. Man, he's into paintings and stuff. You know, um, so what you did was call you sold your originals. Yes. Which is maybe why you were so emotional because yes. a lot of painters don't sell the originals. They sell like a, Prince. I think it's like a lithograph or yeah. serial graph. Mm-hmm. Sorry for butchering the word, but it's, it's, there are two different kinds. You know what I'm saying? One is like field of strokes. The other one is, is just the picture or whatever. But you know, people sell prints of their work, and so maybe that was one one thing that you say. Okay, next time. I'm going to sell a print of my yeah. work so I have my yeah. original. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And I actually just bought an original um, last August. It was my birthday gift to myself nice. from um, Sarah Goulish. And she's an amazing artist. Um, she does uh, particularly like paintings inspired by black women. And she's a Canadian artist. Um, and I bought one of her originals last year and it was a big deal for me to do that because the originals aren't cheap especially Mm -hmm. from good artists so um i was really proud of myself for doing being able to do that for myself and like starting my art collection but it also made me realize how much it had to have meant to her to like be able to ship that off and to give that away because she does like you can still buy a print of the original that you know i purchased from her but Buying that original, it's like it's off. It's her baby. It's gone. Mm. You know, it's, For real. it's in the states now with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I've it was a big it was a big win for me to to purchase that original just because I had been in love with that. That's hard. Particular. It's a it's a drawing. She uses um, charcoal and paint, and in this particular drawing, and it's. She, I had been in love with it for two or three years, and she had never sold it during mm-hmm. that whole two or three year time period. So, finally got my bands up, <laughs> was able mm-hmm. to afford it. So, yep. that was dope. But I think you know, 
you should be on both sides of purchasing and selling so you can get it so you understand what goes into it and it, it's honestly made me really take more time with my work and it's made me just appreciate the process of of make of, of creating something that somebody else might want mm-hmm. <laughs> like you never know yeah so you know we, we're talking about painting right now but you know as I mentioned in the intro, you know, you do a multitude of creating. And so what aspect is your personal favorite writing or photography or painting? You know, what's, what's your favorite thing to do? My favorite thing to do would be writing. Mm. That's my favorite thing to do because books and stories are timeless Mm -hmm. and they get passed down from generation to generation to generation. Like we got people, reading texts from thousands of years ago, Mm -hmm. you know, present day. So it's that writing's my favorite because writing is timeless and and you can be a writer at any age. You can be a writer. There's, there's little kids that have put out books at ages nine and 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. And then you got people that started their writing careers that quit their corporate job and went and started their writing careers in in their fifties and their sixties. So it's one of those things where anybody can do it and the imagination is you can do anything with your imagination and it's easier you know if you're a photographer and you want to like create some imaginative stuff on camera you gotta go get some equipment you gotta (laughs) get some studio time or whatever you gotta get some models it's a lot of working pieces to that Mm. versus as a writer you can it's just you in your pen or your pencil or your laptop, or whatever it is you're writing with, and it that's all you need to create whatever world, whatever story you want. So what is, what is your like you know what is your method to writing? You know, it, it, does it happen over a course time of time? Like you write a little bit and you come back to it, or you know when you have a topic, do you? Is it just all off the head? Is it like all of your views and your opinions? Or do you got you got to go and do research and, and, and incorporate that as well as opinion into your pieces? Well, since I do read a lot, I feel like it's always somewhat researched. Mm. Um, I For me, I write every day in one way or another, uh, whether it's a poem or whether it's, writing in my journal, whether Mm. it's, um, writing, you know, a piece for origin of original. And, you know, just recently I I got hired on to do freelance, uh, writing work for this website. (laughs) Thank you. I'm writing under- Shout shout it out. You also got, uh, (laughs) you're also doing some photography, um, where- Oh yeah, I'm doing a Man. I'm doing the Alter Conference coming okay. up. Okay. Um, which is May sixth through the eighth, mm-hmm. and it is a conference uh, focused on on marginalized people in tech and in gaming specifically. Mm. So I am the official photographer for that. Dope. Really excited about that. Yep. Um. So yeah, like, and right now, like, I just consider everything that I'm doing as just professional practice Mm. like i'm getting out there and i'm getting i'm learning how to interact and how to interact with customers paying customers people i don't know that's the biggest thing for me because people Mm. you know aren't always honest nah not even oh that was great (laughs) awesome exactly (laughs) so it's like people i know you know people i don't know that are gonna give me their honest opinion about my work that's important to me so um but yeah, for writing for those things, I do. I take my time with stuff. I if I, I usually write a piece. Like if I'm write, about to drop a piece on Origin of Original, it's usually written anywhere from a week to a month beforehand, okay. and I just revisit it until it's where I'm happy with it being at. Mm-hmm. Um, and some and then there's things that I've written for the website that have never made it on there. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I mean, you're uh, you know, you're you're writing, but you know. How do you how do you say okay this piece is ready but this piece isn't you know what I'm saying like do you, do you ever worry about how certain pieces will be received or do you just not care and you just say you know what it is what it is you know I don't I don't care if it's controversial or I, you know do you, does that is that ever a thought process of yours like oh I don't want to 
strike a nerve necessarily with this piece or, or you know, how is that for you? Um, that's not necessarily, I wouldn't say that. I would say that I don't write about everything. Okay. Anybody that knows me knows like I'm a big Beyonce fan, but you're Beehive. not. Are you remember the Beehive? <laughs> Yes. Are you so, let, hey, you know, all this artist starving out creations, man. We like to go off on tangents sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Let's talk about the beehive. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, that's that's a popular thing, man. Uh, uh, it's like, you know, a lot of men don't necessarily care for that. You yeah. Know what I mean, why do you think that is? I think a lot of men feel like. I feel like a lot of men respect Beyonce mm -hmm. and her position in the world. And because they do, they feel like all these other women should not compare themselves to her. They look at like okay. people being a fan of Beyonce as as like a comparison. Okay, like, okay. You know, and I think for women, it's more like Beyonce is the big sister either we never had or we had, but she wasn't quite as spectacular yeah. <laughs> as Beyonce. Um, you know, because she just she represents everything that I think. Most women want, I won't say all women, but I think mm -hmm. most women want where you, you want this amazing career, you want this super equally successful husband, mm -hmm. and you want a family, and you want to be like admired for all of those things. Yeah. And I, I think she just kind of represents like the dream for black women, you know, being able, she has it all. For sure. And I think especially for us where we feel like we have to always compromise in one way or another. Yeah. It's really cool to see somebody that didn't have to compromise, that got, you know, we don't know what goes on, you know, behind closed doors mm -hmm. in her real life. But for what all we know, you know, for what we see, she has what everybody would consider the ideal. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we went off on a tangent. You know, <laughs> shout out Beyonce. You know, shout out Jay-Z. Hey, man, Star Wars Creations. Come fuck with us, Jay-Z. You know, uh, but you know, let's get back to the craft, man. You know, you, you, you discovered you were passionate about creation at a certain moment and and you know now we're here so from that point of first realizing hey you know this is something that i'm passionate about to now and you're building your brand up and stuff how would you say you have grown you know or progressed as an artist you know whether it be content or just your outlook on things how, how have you grown between those two points in time um i've grown a lot and and the main way the main version of growth i've seen is just caring more mm. you know when you are conscious and aware of so much you know you get to a point where you just feel like oh. Nothing I do is really going to matter because at the end of the day, like <laughs> yeah, all this yeah. stuff is kind of already mapped oh, yeah. out. Like, can I really make a difference? <laughs> can I really make it? You know, like, yeah. you, like, so I had to go through that like existential crisis moment in my life where mm -hmm. I just didn't care about anything, you know, but myself and, and my child and now I'm coming back around to where it's like, okay, you're 27. You got a lot of life left to live if you do it right. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you want to say about yourself 20 years from now? What do you want to say? What do you want people to say about you 30 years from now? Um, so it's just really been like, okay, I need I need to get busy and I need to be serious about the things that I'm doing in For life. Sure. Um, but the biggest growth that I've seen is just more like, self-confidence um and i always tell people people when i tell people like i i am insecure too people, people are always like yeah right and i'm like no like yeah, yeah, i yeah, feel sure. it's hard especially as a like as somebody that's creating as an artist like there's always doubt there's oh, always yeah. doubt that people are not going to feel the same way about your work that you feel about it and you just have to like put it out there anyway and then so in taking on that mentality of I'm just going to do it anyway, it transfers over into other stuff. It transfers over into, you know, work and it transfers over into like what I'm doing in my own personal life and mm. like my mental health and my physical health. And it's just like, there's no excuse. We can make all these excuses for ourselves. I mean, like right now, you know, I told you it came in. I'm on a juice cleanse right now. No, I'm really no, on a path this year to like get my eating habits right, get healthy, get like fit and not like Instagram model fit, like just at a healthy weight, yeah, yeah, like healthy good. space, feel good about yeah. myself. And um, 
it has been a process because it's like everybody's like, you know, people have a ton of excuses. Like, oh, you know, my grandfather is 78 and he's been eating bacon his whole life <laughs> and he's never had nothing. And it's like, you know, you can't, you can go off of them excuses all you want. But at the end of the day, like. Hold on, hold on, so I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to, I want to go back to something you just said. You know, you're talking <laughs> about you're on a juice cleanse and you're trying to get right and stuff. You know, there's a lot of pressure you know i i have a woman on the show so oh, we need to yeah. talk some woman yeah. stuff you know what i'm saying <laughs> you know there's For a sure. lot of pressure on women yeah to, totally. whether it be image your appearance how you carry yourself there's a lot of pressure and you know you see these people on, like you're saying on instagram or whatever and, and you know it's not real a lot of the times but you know there's a lot of pressure on women and their appearance specifically you know wh- what do you think about that um well it's it's tough it's tough for everybody. I'm not a makeup wearer. I've been like natural mm. my whole life as far as my hair goes. But I would never knock a woman that wears makeup and that's not natural, you know, chooses to wear we- weaves or wigs or whatever because it's so hard to look in the mirror and be okay with yourself as a woman because you are constantly going to be compared to other women, whether you want to or not. Mm. You're, you are constantly going to see other women and see the things that they have. I think that's where a lot of women are kind of wrapped up right now is they're seeing these women who are, you know, on Instagram and they're flying, taking trips Mm -hmm. and they got bags and shoes and nice cars. And it's like, dang, I, can I get a dude to do that for me? (laughs) What do I got to do to get a guy to do that for me? uh, No disrespect, but a lot of those women... (laughs) Are hoeing. Yeah, that's very <laughs> so let's, true. Let's be frank about that's that. That's very true. <laughs> but you know, it's I just I hear that a lot okay. in conversation with you know, whether it's my peers or whether it's people just chit chatting online. Like people want to be okay with themselves, but it's very hard to do that, especially women in the internet era, mm-hmm. because everything's so photoshopped. Oh yeah, and so. In response to that, a lot of men who, if they're not really thinking men, thinking type men, expect for women to look that way. Like, we're in an era where if somebody takes a picture of somebody and they have cellulite, people be grossed out. It's like, <laughs> that's what people supposed to have. No, nah, man, you know what I'm gross. You know what I'm grossed <laughs> out when I see some little tiny legs and then a huge old ant booty. It's like, bro, come on, bro. Come on, man. Right, like, you like, look goo, you look like a buffoon, man. Right. And Why? if you think you're gonna have some cellulite, yeah, yeah. it don't matter. Even if you work out every day, there's gonna be a little cellulite back there. So But hold on, hold on. Cause K Dot said that. He said, you know, so, you know, I'm so fucking sick and tired of the Photoshop. But you posted a think piece about K Dot. And it said, okay, you know, even though he said that, then he followed that up by saying something that women didn't really feel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So talk to me about that. You know, how 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 can you how how can we as men, you know, keep a balance of, okay, you know, saying we like this, but not making you feel self conscious about that. Well, I think for women it just always feels like a contradiction. Mm. And it's like, oh, okay, you guys say that you want natural. You say that you want this or that, but you got a very particular way of what you want natural to look like. Or y'all say y'all don't want girls with fake bodies, but those be the ones that y'all be, you know, giving all the attention to or clamoring to get (laughs) next to. (laughs) And so for women, it's just like, y'all say this, but that's not what we see. Okay. Um, And I think... In, in terms of like celebrity and, and, and Kendrick Lamar speaking out and Tyrese is caught in flack for saying yeah, stuff yeah, too. Um, I think in, the, in terms of that, it's just, it's kind of like black women just don't, we don't want nobody telling us what to do, mm-hmm. no matter who it is. For sure. I don't necessarily agree with all of that. You know, I feel like we got to be open on both sides, men and women, we have to be open to hear each other and, and, understand where each other is coming from but i do understand as a black woman where you feel picked and prodded and and then on top of that you get women like kim kardashian and 
the little how about that chick who oh like take gosh. on these like <laughs> black girl aesthetics <laughs> and um oh, run man. with it and they yeah. get notoriety for it so then it's like when we do it is yeah. you know all this negative connotation yeah, to yeah. it for sure so you know it's just it's that constant being pulled back and forth mm. of like why can't like where 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 is it safe for me to just be me mm. yeah so you know we don't went off on a tangent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> let's let's really back. You know we was talking about the craft and everything like that. You know when you're, you know, as an artist in, in this society, man, everything is so out with the old, in with the new. You know everybody's attention span is so short. And you know, do you ever get frustrated uh, as an artist by the way or how quickly art is consumed? Because you can spend, you know, like you said, you it might have something in the vault for a month and then drop it. And then people read it, boom, it's over in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. You know, do you ever get frustrated by the way art is consumed? Um, I mean, I think for any artist, it can be frustrating. But I mean, the way I see it is the cream always rises to the top. Mm. Like it doesn't matter. Like cause for me, it's not a race. Like whether I, you know, become a New York best-selling author in two years or ten years, it it's no different to me as long as you know, the, the goal is met. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the speed in which people consume things has made it difficult for people to find their own stride and their own confidence. Um, and it has, it has caused a lot of creative people to lose the art of mastering something Mm. of really taking your time to develop a skill and get better. Um, but the people that do that will always win. Even like if you think about the artists that created, you know, the, the pyramids and the temple, you know, in the, the, the temples at Karnak in Egypt, okay. you have these in Stonehenge and all of these things. We'll never know those artists names, but their monuments Live will on. live on yeah. and they're and they're considered you know wonders of the world mm-hmm. and people travel from all over the world to see these things oh, yeah. and it's like that's what it's about i guarantee that those people that created that stuff didn't it wasn't about okay i want to make sure everybody remembers my name like they got the notoriety like in that time period i'm sure but it was more so about creating something that lived past their own mortal legacy well because they also didn't have the internet back right then. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so exactly. the internet has really screwed the i mean it's helped but it's really screwed a lot of things up you know as yeah. far as artistry goes because not only is it out with the old in with the new it's just so saturated it's so much stuff yeah it's like where do where, what do i look at you know there's, there's so many things in my face you know what i'm saying Okay, so you know we we've been chopping game, man. This is this has been such a pleasure, man. We talked about everything from motherhood to crafting to creating, writing, all of that. You know what I'm saying? And now we're about to talk a little bit about the business. You know, so you know you have a, a website. You know, would you call yourself a blogger? I wouldn't call myself a blogger. Okay, uh, only because I feel like bloggers are very um, on the minute. Mm. With inf- with how they distribute information, and okay. I don't I don't work on a particular schedule with okay. how I put things out. Um, I would just say that I'm I'm a writer, mm. and Origin of Original is a living portfolio. <laughs> so you know, Origin of Original, man, you better go check it out, man. If you haven't already, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, you know. But um, how do you, as, as a writer, and you have a website and you're pushing your brand, how do you make money or, or capitalize off of Let's talk specifically about the website. How do you make money off of that business? Um, the way that I've been able to bring income to myself from the website is primarily through using it as a portfolio. Mm. Like when I am pitching stories to writing hubs or when I am um, like with the with the Alter Conference you know, I was, my aunt actually pointed me in the direction of that and uh, sat, shout out to my auntie Celeste. <laughs> Dang, shout her out, shout her out. Um, she pointed me in the direction of that and she always like throws me lobs and when she finds opportunities she thinks Dope. I would be good at. Um, and all it was was literally submitting a like quick little info sheet and it's like name, you know, 
email address and like a link to your work. You know, we're not in an era where you go in for an interview and bring your big book portfolio portfolio. with you. (laughs) You know, you send a link. You send a link. You send a link to your work. And so that's why it's it's been important for me to really take my time with my site and, and create something that I can be proud of. Mm. And then I can feel okay telling people, okay, yeah, click on this link. Mm. <laughs> You'll see what you need yeah. to see. Because it looks professional. You know, it's all right there. It's easy to access. Yeah. Yeah. Thank for you. For sure. So thank what, you. you know, overall, what is the goal of your brand? Um, the goal of my brand of, Origin of Original is I, I want it to be like an umbrella mm. for other media and um, artistic things that I take on. Uh, I have lots of ideas. I think of new things every day. Okay. <laughs> and um, basically, I just want Origin of Original to, to kind of be like the flagship mm. um, for where, what everything else will kind of span off from. Um, I, I, I want it to be what the in title implies it to be is an original, very unique um, hub of art and eventually design mm. um, that I, I just want it to be able to, I just want to be able to not only build something myself, but show people like, this is what I built and this is how you can build it. But origin of original will never be like, uh, you come to the site and I'll tell you how to get your blog oh, yeah. type thing. That'll <laughs> never be, it'll, it'll never be that. Yeah, but yeah. I want, it is like my testament of saying, I know how to do this. Okay. And it takes time, but I'm going to make sure I do it right. So, okay. So, you know, in, in a world of the internet and, and clickbait, you know, a, a lot of things are misleading and, and everybody is just so, you know, click in a click frenzy, you know what I'm saying? So how do you as an artist, you know, maintain integrity with your work, but also make it presentable in a way that people will click on it or gravitate toward it. Because a lot of times, you know, if it's something meaningful or truthful or real, people are like, oh, I don't want to see that. They'll click on the bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So how do you, as as a, as a artist with a message and, and meaningful content, how do you compete amongst that type of environment? Um, well, the main thing is have a good title, have a title, you know, if you're writing a, a piece, have something that kind of draws people in that makes them one, feel like it's worth clicking on and two, something that they want to read. Like I never go for outlandish titles. Like I'll never have some like 10 ways, <laughs> <laughs> 10 ways to up your followers yeah, and, yeah. and Get your Kanye workout plan on. Like, it'll never be nothing (laughs) like that, you know? But, like, uh, but I do, you know, like, the last piece I wrote on my site was why we all should love Raphael Sadiq a little Mm, more. Yep. And, you know, it's, it's like, if you know Raphael Sadiq, and it, and it's really, honestly, I don't care if you don't click on it. Like, if you like Raphael Sadiq's music, you're going to click on that. If you don't like Raphael Sadiq's music, maybe you just heard of him on the Rick Ross album, mm. you're going to click on it and say, okay, you know, I like that joint. What What is she talking about otherwise? Mm. So, like, you know, I don't write for clicks. Like, I, I will write, like, you know, under a pseudonym, I'm, I will write for clicks. For sure. But for my personal website, it's not what it's about. It's just more so about putting out quality in, and I feel like the people that want to read quality stuff will come and read it. For sure. Because um, there's so much, like you said, there's B, there's so much BS out there. All these, like, like the standard blog page article is going to be anywhere from 200 to 500 words, and that's not nothing. That's not even, like, a full, like, typed out paper. Mm. Like, if you're in school, your teacher told you to do 300 word paper that's like half a paper single line (laughs) so you have you know the the typing and the word so it's not a lot of information that they give you and um so i try you know i have longer pieces people have complimented you know have commented and said that you you know your pieces are kind of long and it's like yeah because i want people to read them when they have the time to read them it's not meant to be digested quickly Mm. 
It's not meant to be like clicked on and read really quick and then you move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I want you to take the time to sit down and and read through it. And I feel like that's the people that have interacted with my site thus far, that's how they've had to do it. Like I had to sit down and make time to read two or three of your pieces. And that's what I want because everything's so go, go, go. Mm -hmm. It means a lot to me for people to have to sit down and actually focus on one thing at a time. I remember, um, you know, a couple of posts ago, you know, you were, you were talking about, you know, your services and, and establishing a price for your services. Mm-hmm. You know, how do you establish a value, so to speak, for, for what you can provide to someone, you know, whether it be photography or if somebody asks you to write a piece, how do you say, okay, this is how much I need to do this? You know what I mean? Um, I think it's different for everybody. Like it, it's important for you. I will say it's important not to like undersell yourself. Um, cause usually, you know, I, I will put out a rate and they'll be like, okay. Like, or they'll throw a couple of dollars on top of that. Yep. If I get offered some more money, I'm always like, I should have asked for more. That's dope. <laughs> I should have asked for more. Cause if they yeah. was willing to give me more then I probably could have got even more than what they was oh, willing yeah. to give me. But, um, For me, it's just mainly, I'm very honest about where I'm at um, Mm skill-wise. So if I feel like I'm not as talented as, like, say, an artist that's charging $100, $200 an hour, I'm not going to charge you that. For sure. Um, You know, because that's what's fair. I want to, and I want, and I don't, and I also don't want to set an expectation for you that I can't meet. Like, if I charge you $200 an hour to do photography and I give you $50 an hour photos, you're going to be mad. Like, versus if I charge you that 50 bucks an hour and you pay that and then you are more, you're more than pleased with what you got. I would feel better about that. And that's also just better for the brand because people are like, wow, I got great work for discounted price. Mm. But, you know, that's just starting up, you know, starting out. Once you really feel confident, I would charge more to write for somebody than I would for photography because I feel more confident in the writing. Okay. And I know that the writing is going to be great writing. That's dope. So, you know, it's all about where you feel like you're at in, in what you're doing. But, you know, it's great to see what everybody else is out there charging mm. and, and kind of find a, a happy medium. And so with your, you know, that was like, you know, talking about writing and photography and stuff. But, you know, in your piece where you're talking about being emotional, selling your paintings, you mentioned that, you know, first you said one price and then you said a different price. Yeah. You know, so how how do you establish a price for your paintings? That's hard because, you know, I could have kept those originals and kept working and got way better at my paintings. And then those originals would be like, I could look at those originals and be like, oh, those aren't great at all. Those are from when I first started, but they'll be worth so much. Like I guarantee the first drawings that Picasso or Basquiat did are worth millions. Oh yeah. <laughs> no matter what it is, it could be chicken scratch. Yeah. Um. So, you know, that's, I guess it's all relative to, to where you're at in life. Um. For me, I threw, you know, I went high what I asked for. I mm-hmm. asked for what the emotional value of a yeah. word to me. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, I kind of sticker shocked the lady that wanted to buy them. And it wasn't that she didn't want them. She just was like, wow, that's a lot of money. I wasn't expecting to pay that mm-hmm. much to come out. But then I had to kind of have a quick conversation with myself was like, somebody wants to take your paintings home. Yeah. Like somebody likes your stuff enough to want to take them home with them and that meant a lot to me it's like wow like i would never you know we walk past stuff all the time you know you walk past a a pile of like free stuff on the Mm -hmm. side of the road you're not gonna pick up all that stuff and take it with you Yeah, yeah you know even if it's something you're purchasing we walk past a ton of stuff in the mall every day doesn't mean you buy everything you walk past. Mm-hmm. So for somebody to want to spend their money that they worked hard for on something that I created, that mm-hmm. that meant a lot to me. And so I was willing to like lower the price for her to be able to like share in that experience with me. So, you know, we're talking about the business and, you know, one thing that comes with business is, you know, whether it be uh, writing or, you know, copyright. And, and do you ever worry about, plagiarism or, or you know people stealing your content and using it as their own um 
Yeah, I do, actually. There was certain stuff that I came here today. Like, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm still <laughs> working on the paperwork for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, one thing that all creatives should know is that once you post something online, you do have legal rights to it. Mm. You can, like, if somebody is plagiarizing your stuff or using your work, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact... Um, organization but there is an organization that you can and file legal action with okay. and they will you know either have that person take that stuff down you know it, and it's simple it's like a request to take it down and if they don't take it down then you know more harsher penalties can be um, put in place but um that's just something that you always have to worry about people get fake pages created of them all oh, the time yeah. oh yeah um and while I would be devastated if I like logged on to Time magazine and one of my pieces <laughs> was up there under somebody else's byline. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing I, I always tell, you know, other creatives that I, that I'm close to is that like you're the source. Mm -hmm. Like so people can bite your style all they want, they'll never be able to really duplicate what you do. For sure. Cause you're always gonna they're gonna be on the old thing and you're going to be on to the next new thing. Yeah. They're going to be copying your old style. You're going to be creating something totally different. And that's how, I, you know, I feel like basically if, if that's all you got is copying other people's work, then good luck because you yeah. ain't going to be able to sustain I that. I mean, it's a compliment. They yeah. biting. It's right. a compliment. Exactly. You know, so, so on your journey, you know, it's a process and, and it's a, like I said, it's a journey. So what, you know, it's a two-part question. What are some of your favorite things about building up your business? And then what are some of your least favorite things about building up your business? Um, I will, I'll start with the least favorite. My least favorite thing is like the slow moments mm. when you just kind of like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Mm. Um, there's like, like I'm about to go through another like sprint of busy where I have a lot of things going on and mm. I'm working on different stuff. And then, you know, you come off of that and you just have this kind of like down period. Mm. And it's like, what do I do to like <laughs> fill this space? Like, am I not doing enough? Like, why did it slow up? Um, and I just really learned to like use that time period to like build and grow within myself and find what I can do to do better. Yeah. And since I'm a, I'm very much I want to be clear that I am a developing Artist, for sure, so in for sure. <laughs> God, don't don't understand, <laughs> don't undersell yourself. But no, I'm definitely you're not. Real, you're raw. You're raw. <laughs> you're a dope writer. I've seen your pictures. You're raw. Don't thank you. Come on, don't Thank be you. modest here now. Come um, on now. But you know, I, I spend that time to, to keep working on things and keep impressing myself. Um, I think my favorite thing about it is whenever I make money. And it doesn't come from my job. It feels so dope. Dope. Like, wow, I generated this by myself. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I have this goal, like, you know, I need to start writing this stuff down. But this is just like daily mantra stuff that's in my head. And it's like, I just want to make as much money as I make at my job. Mm -hmm. Like, if I can get to a point where I can generate that much money for myself, then I'm not worried about nothing. Because <laughs> I feel like if I can generate, you know, that five figure number then i can generate a six figure number and i can mm -hmm. generate a seven figure number like it, just being able to make money for myself is like the best feeling of just knowing wow like what i i can create something that will create income for myself well okay so you said if you could create if you could generate as much as you make on your job so okay if you brought your brand up to that level would you quit your job or would you keep your job and keep doubling up? See, I am I have this conversation with myself a lot because I'm always like, what would I do? Because I am, I'm one person, I care about my livelihood and I care about my stability, mostly for my daughter. And so I'm always like, dang, like what, you know, what, would I quit? Like, or would I, you know, I think initially I would cut back. Mm -hmm. I would go part time, like maybe two, three days a week. But once I felt like, okay, this is enough, like I can do this. Mm. Once I get over that, like that little bit of fear, like that, you know, that that's, that's the leap of faith right mm. there. People think the leap of faith is just quitting their job and like yeah, yeah. taking off running. <laughs> the leap of faith is that moment where you're like, I can do this, but can I really do this? For sure. And so I think 
that'll be what that is for me. Like once I get to that point, I'll, I'll probably, there'll probably be a period where I'm doing both and then it'll be too much. And I'll be like, okay, I have to let this go. <laughs> and, um, time. Yeah. And uh, you know, you just have to like be patient with yourself. Mm. I, I'm all, I'm a big proponent, you know, a big, big person on like, letting yourself go through those phases and letting mm. yourself like and operating and like don't rush yourself through like let it i like i i can tell you right now there will probably be a six month period where i will be working my business and working my day job oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh, i will yeah. probably be hating my day job in that time period <laughs> but it's necessary for me to take that next step be walking around the office like man i don't need this <laughs> shit i'm an artist <laughs> i'm about to be up out of this yes. in a minute yeah. you know so so you mentioned you know bringing your your um your uh business up to the level of your current income at your job you know that may be one form of success but what what will have to happen for you to say you know, this is a success or I am successful in this. Is it a monetary value? Is it a amount of pieces that you've regenerated? You know, what what is success for you and your business? Um, man, that's a tough question. I think success for me will be once I've created something that I know will outlive me. Mm. That will be success for me. When I've made something that I know will outlive me and something that, like, my daughter can look back on and be like, my mom did this yeah. and it's dope, like, that will be success for me. And that, you know, that could happen 50 years from now. Yeah. But, you know, once I hit that benchmark, I will feel, like, content. Hopefully, I can feel content before that because I'm sure. one of those yeah. people that is like constantly. You gotta going. get the flowers where you can still yeah, smell them. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I will be like, I feel sick, yeah. like I succeeded in life at that point. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> you, you you already uh, putting it all together, man. Like I said, you're you're being modest, you know. You're saying, you know, you're you're underselling yourself. You're dope <laughs> with the writing, you know. Check out Origin of Original, you know. But but what's next for you and your brand? You know, you you said you have a, a upcoming gig where you're gonna be. A photographer you know you got some uh, editorial pieces yeah i'm doing some freelance writing okay um, i'm writing under a pseudonym so you guys might not actually okay. see it if you're good if you know my writing then maybe you will but uh, why so why why are you writing under a pseudonym i'm writing under a pseudonym because it's um it's a website that's generated that generates income through clicks so there's a lot of advertisement it's not an actual like they the creators of it want it to be more of an entertainment hub, but it's it'll be on the level of like um, a TMZ or like oh, a, okay, a okay. Perez Hilton. So it'll be writing that I don't normally do on my own site and under my own name. So it'll be under a pseudonym because I want to like maintain my personal brand. But you know, you got to make some money too <laughs> so i'm gonna you know do it under. so will you be posting links of those or is that just yeah. gonna be low key i will i will post links of it okay. i may not say that it's actually my okay, work yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but i will be posting it okay. and it'll be out there and you know it'll be dope if i see somebody share it That's without dope. me putting it up that's hard. That'll be cool. You know, so 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 where can the people find you at? You know, you said you'll post links, but if somebody wanted to go check out your writing, you got the website, you, you know, you're on different social media platforms. Where can people find you at to, to get in touch with Jacqueline? Um, well, if you want to find me, you can find me. You can definitely find me at originoforiginal.com. Um, there's a contact link there, a contact tab there. So you can shoot me an email or, or whatever. I check that email every day. Dope. Um, then I'm also on Twitter at 10 letters deep. Um, and then I'm on Instagram at both origin of original and there's an underscore at the end and then 10 letters deep also on, um, Instagram. So 10 letters deep on Instagram. It's more of my personal page and then origin of original is more tied to the site. And so as the, as that develops, you'll see a, a more conscious split off between the mm -hmm. two. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. That's where you can find me. Um, 
please go to the website. That's where, and not even like on some begging type stuff, but like that's where that's the best place to find dope. find my work and find my dope stuff. content, man. Yeah. I'm telling you, she's she's coming with it. She got dope content. You know, uh, like I said, follow the Instagram because that's where you're gonna see the raw pictures. You know, I I'll be like, man, you know, she are, are you do you, are you responsible for the post and all of that? Like, yeah, you, you editing them and everything. That's all me. Okay. Even on the blog, if there's a photo, like I will say, like on the blog, like if it's a photo that I didn't take, it'll it'll be noted. That's art. Um, but all the pictures and stuff associated with the with with um my pieces on the on the website are photos I've taken too. So, Most of Yeah. Well, y'all, man, there you have it, man. Artist to artist, you know, Jacqueline Hamilton, man. I just want to say, you know, thank you for coming and blessing my show, man. This has been, uh, you know, such an exciting time for me to really sit back and pick your brain. You know, I see your presence online and social media and stuff, but to have you in person and to pick your brain about your your grind and your brand, you know, it's been very insightful. You oh, know what I'm saying? Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, for thank sure, you, for, for sure. sure. So, you know, Origin of Original, man. Get out there, support her, man. You know, dope writer, entrepreneur, and... <laughs> Chopping game, man. Artist to artist, J S A C. Yeah, uh, if you creative, come sit down with me.